the board of director for the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, and if you don't know what we do already, we are an environmental nonprofit. We have an office right here in St. Pete and we work to protect and conserve any transplant species. And we do that at uh, these monthly speaker series here. This will be our, our last event here at this location. We'll resume our um, normal monthly event in the patio starting next month. Um, and we do this in partnership with Friends of Tampa Bay National Wildlife Refuges. And I have Billy here who's going to give us um, a little bit of an update on, you may have heard about Aymanki and the, the big fires they had there. So he's going to put all of our worries to rest and give us an update there. And then Rachel Kern is our law clerk, and she'll be introducing our speaker for the evening, Andy Mele, who will talk to us about phosphate mining in Florida. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Yes, there was a little fire on Edge My Key. You might have seen it on the news or read it in the paper, but uh, lightning strike occurred, and we lost about, or gained, 80 acres of nice, fresh, new soil. Still. Uh, the undergrowth was all burned out, and they had planned to do a prescribed burn on that island. It just occurred without any input except for lightning. Uh, there were three fire departments coming down and helped do it. Uh, the fire basically was just south of the uh, lighthouse, uh, mostly on the east side, all the way down to the pilot compound. Uh, fortunately, the gopher tortoises and many of the critters found a home based underground. But of fox turtles, we did find some fox turtles that didn't get here, not quite as smart as the, the gophers. Uh, but I wanted to let you know about 200 acres is the size of the island, and to think that 80 acres burned up uh, actually turned out to be a good thing. And saved a, saved a little bit of um, red tape because they've been trying to get a permit to do that. They're trying to get funds to do that, and it's done. So, thank you, Mother Nature. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Rachel Kernan. I'm a law clerk with the center. I'm here to introduce you to our next speaker, Andy Mele. 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 Like. <laughs> Um, Andy has a BA and MS in environmental science from Bard College. He is the author of Polluting for Pleasure, which revealed the magnitude of oil and gas pollution in America's waterways from two-stroke outboard motors and personal watercraft, and led to transformation of the recreational boating industry. From 1994 to 1998, Mele was the environmental director at Clearwater, working on a wide variety of water quality issues, including some important early steps in the development of the Hudson River Park. He is Sun Coast Waterkeeper for the Sierra Manatee Tampa Bay region, in affiliation with the International Waterkeeper Alliance, and co-chair of the Sierra Club's Sarasota Groups Conservation Committee. Please welcome Andy, he's here to talk to you about phosphate mining. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, being an environmental guy is, uh, is often uh, difficult because you wind up uh, giving everybody horrible news and terrible stories and you want to see all the people's long faces and there's going to be a lot of that tonight so I apologize beforehand. I also like to ask you to, um, I love audience participation, I normally encourage it but in this particular case uh, this PowerPoint has run to like two plus hours in its early testing, because people kept asking questions in the middle of it, and all these discussions would break out and everything. So I'm going to ask you to hold your questions till the end, because many of them will be answered along the way. So if you'll just be, if you just bear with me, and, and let me just rip through the thing. We're using we're using sort of intermediate tech here today. This is my uh, Bluetooth touchpad because the one on my old Mac is screwed up. All right, so this is about phosphate mining. What um, the, the photograph that's uh, shown here behind the title is a huge sinkhole that appeared in the top of a phosphogypsum stack. You know those big, tall, flat-topped mountains they look like? They look like old landfills. I used to think they were landfills for the longest time. Uh, driving up I-75, you see a couple of them. Uh, there's one in Piney Point down by Manatee County, northern Manatee County. They are uh, filled at the top. The top is a lake. It's not just dry, it's a lake. And it's filled with a sand, you know, water that is the pH of battery acid, roughly. And so uh, this thing here had been leaking down into the soil, and you all know what Florida is made of, limestone, it's base. 
you had the acid going down there. There was a rumbling that could be heard at night in houses uh, around this fossil gypsum stack, and they would complain. They'd be trying to sleep, and they'd hear the ground crumbling as if it had indigestion, which in fact it did. And then one day, wham, this thing opened up, sucked down the entire lake on top of the thing, and, uh, and it all went down to parts unknown, and we're drinking it right now, today, as we speak, out of the floor in an aquifer. So that's, that's just one of the many colorful things that happens with uh, uh, phosphate mining. Let's see, there we go. Phosphate mining has been around forever, it's nothing new. Um, it started off as a sort of a cottage industry kind of thing with horsepower and manpower. Um, and it was, it was kind of a, a prospecting thing. It was a little like gold rush. It was a, it was a you know, pr pursuit of quick wealth. Uh, because I guess you could turn it around. The deal with what, what phosphate is, is uh, a, a phosphorus containing rock, rich in phosphorus. It's a, a result of a fossilized formation from a, a long ago seabed. Uh, this area um, just inland from here is called the Bone Valley. And it's not because there's like bones in it or anything, but it is made from basically the bones of ancient fishes and uh, uh, smaller marine organisms. Um, it's used for fertilizer. I mean, it is used for chemical fertilizer for the most part. The two big fertilizers are uh, ingredients are phosphorus and, and nitrogen. And uh, you may have encountered phosphorus recently uh, in your readings about the, uh, the algae problem in Lake Okeechobee because uh, the entire state of Florida drains very slowly southward in a sheet uh, from the, the Orlando and the Lake Lands all the way south and all along the way it picks up tons and tons and tons of phosphorus and nitrogen containing uh, fertilizers, other chemicals and things, but really it's those nutrients, those fertilizers that wind up, that had wound up developing and, and accumulating and accumulating and accumulating in the bottom of Lake Okeechobee until um, uh, recently we've just had this massive um, algae uh, event. It's not the first time it's happened. It happened in the St. John's River about 10 years ago. It happens periodically here and there. The springs are getting... I'm off the topic. Okay. Uh, you get the picture. Florida has a troubled water uh, condition. And... Alright, so as technology uh, evolved, so did phosphate mining, this is steam, steam power. Um, you can see rather graphically in this photograph um, the depth to which uh, the, the people dig to get to the phosphate. The top 20, 25 feet is called euphemistically the overburn. To us, that's the good part. That's the part that supports life. It's the part that uh, supports habitat and supports animals and all sorts of species. Uh, allows us to grow cattle, to build homes, and, and you know, live on the water courses trickle on there and everything. And uh, so they just dig right through that, uh, including digging right through the surficial aquifer, the top aquifer, perhaps going as deep as the, uh, the uppermost of the intermediate aquifers, just dig it up and throw it away. And the water comes pouring in and they just sort of pump it out and deal with it. And they eventually wind up hitting a uh, phosphate rock about you know, 40 or 50 feet down, and that's 20 feet deep, so they dig that out. And this is a classic uh, pit formation. Today, we are running on diesel and electric. I'm sorry about the screen, it's a little touchy here. But um, what you're looking at is, well, give me one second, I have a laser pointer. that's coming off a vast field that is just over beyond this fence line. 
of, uh, of just exposed raw dust and rock and everything. This school bus, well, I would love to say it's a school bus and it's full of tiny, vulnerable, helpless children. It is full of migrant workers, and that's no better or no worse. It's just a, it, it's just an example of, of the various types of exposure that people uh, have to phosphate and the changing technology. You drive by um, any place in the hard Florida around here, and you will see these things. Uh, they, they look like the superstructures of ships looming up out of the desert. After the stuff is mined, it gets turned into a slurry and then sent down to uh, various uh, uh, facilities uh, for a process called beneficiation or benefication. I, I'm not sure how the pronunciation works. They call it benefication. This is an Orwellian term. It has the root of the word good in it, bene, benefication, like benefit or that sort of thing. And so benefication is supposed to provide to us all uh, uh, you know, vast benefits. Father, you, you got to hand it to Mosaic. They have been wordsmithing and message crafting uh, in a way that would make um, uh, you know Hitler proud. Frankly, it's just like the most astonishing. It would make certainly make Orwell proud. Um, the, the 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 twisting and turning of words. We'll encounter some more of them later. Uh, this is the. Um, Alafaya River chemical plant. It's been there since 1929. It was one of the first uh, actual chemical facilities built. Uh, there's the Alafaya right there, and this is the beginnings of the bay. Um, the, the, the stuff gets brought down here and gets uh, a, goes through a flotation process in which uh, it is essentially uh, immersed in waste oils. And the waste oils react in such a way that the, that the, the, the phosphate rock that is the slurry that's been mashed up small enough rises to the top, gets combed off, and that becomes off to become the, the chemical fertilizer. Then the rest goes through a process of, you know, where they redo it a couple of times. This waste oil ultimately um, is, after a bunch of recyclings, is returned to the earth from whence it came once upon a time and is, uh, is a big part of uh, Mosaic's um, Dividies permits, uh, waste discharge permits. Uh, Don Rice, sitting there in a black t-shirt, has developed a much better map than this, but I didn't have time to get it onto this uh, slideshow. This is just a you know a map pulled off the internet, and I cross-hatched all the counties that have gone through intensive phosphate mining. That's the Bone Valley. This is the wealthy, developed East Coast, uh, and of course you have the wealthier and developed coastline here. And I should say not all of Polk County has been uh, mined, but a good half of it has. Half of Polk County has been mined. You can see it from the air, you can see it even looking at the maps, you can see these unique water forms of, uh, of, of lakes and things that have filled up. Um, the blue is meant to indicate the southward flow of surface waters, and this tan-colored arrow, which is panther-colored, is meant to show the northward possible migration route of uh, a various species uh, as they're escaping climate change, sea level rise, and various other things. I mean, uh, the, the panther in particular is always trying to reassert itself into its historic range, which went all the way up through the southeast and down into Texas, until finally it was split off in two, became the Texas panther, the Florida panther, and, uh, and recently the Texas panther came back to the genetic rescue of the Florida panther with some fresh alleles that are helping the Florida panther um, get back on its feet again, as it were, genetically speaking. But look, this little, okay, this is, this is lying with maps a little bit, but you know, it basically, phosphate mining has, has created a, a zone of uh, uh, habitat desert, I'll call it, 
that takes up half the state of Florida. You get maybe a, a, a tenth of the state of Florida from the other side, and you've got a total narrowing of the corridor, which is still a crisscross with roads, farms, fences, everything else. And it makes it extremely difficult. Um, about the only thing you hear about Panthers anymore is, oh, another one got killed on a road. First thing that happens on, with uh, phosphate mining is the land gets cleared. Every last scrap of vegetation, including you know whatever animals get left behind, you know box turtles, yeah, God knows, um, go up in flames. Pressure slips off, um, and this is the result. The result is a this is a uh, an open pit current operating mine. There's our drag line. That's a football field right there. I can't even see the, the cars and trucks there. Uh, but, but the landforms of phosphate mining extend as far as the eye can see. This is a toxic waste settling area. They call them CSAs or clay settling areas, which is a nice harmless sounding term for a toxic waste settling area. The stuff that, um, that, that comes out of these lakes and other uh, parts, other older facilities that Mosaic operates, all mined out. They're still exuding uh, uh, waste that is too toxic to go into the environment. So what they do is they, uh, they dilute it. Um, they, have, they have a different term. They have another Orwellian term, which escapes me right now, but um, it's, uh, it's uh, something like um, blend, it's blending. Blending is their term. <laughs> it's, it's beneficiation, it's blending. What it is, is it's diluting the toxic waste so that it meets regulatory thresholds so they can then dump it in. It's the same toxic waste dumped into the same water bodies, sent on downstream, or pumped into the ground. And it's just because it's diluted with water that is basically public property, our property. Um, they have a permit to use uh, 64 million gallons a day um, of uh, potable water, which is a significant amount of water, and um, and they use about 10% of that for this blending. But uh, you know these these fields; these are not just happy little fields. These are old phosphate mines. This is an old phosphate mine in places it just goes off as far as the eye can see. And I'll try to. Um, this is, the air is where you really get the, the the drama of phosphate mining. This used to be habitat. This used to be somebody's habitat. That used to be somebody's habitat, too. Now, this is interesting because it looks like they're filling in with waste from some other mine. The white stuff is, um, I don't really know what the white stuff is. You see it all the time. I've always assumed it was something that with a bunch of phosphate in it, because phosphate tends to be white. Maybe it's the tailings from the, you know what it is? Probably gypsum. 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 Yeah. Gypsum the way okay. it turns white. Bob? Not gypsum. Gypsum goes to the stacks. That's sand. Sand. What's left? Now, three things that come out of the mine. Phosphate rock. Phosphate rock comes out. Comes out. Uh, clay. Clay it's comes off out. Goes off settling. to the settling areas. What's left to fill in the holes that they've done is sand. Right. This is their attempt to try to fill it in. They're missing, well, other than clay that goes in Bob has a sample back at his house at the glass jar. He calls it Abby Normal. I don't know if you remember Young Frankenstein, Frankenstein. <laughs> this is this lump of stuff came out of the bottom of a clay settling area at one point, and it's um, it's there on his shelf. Um, yeah, so just just do the math. You, you've got 60 feet of ground. You, you've dug it up. You've taken 20 percent of it away. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, 20 feet of it away, about a third of it away, and you've turned it into, you know, product. Uh, and you're stuck, and a lot of it has to go off to these clay settling areas, so maybe 40% of it's gone. How do you fill in the hole? Well, you don't. You leave these clay settling areas, and you call them part of your reclamation process. This looks to me, and I'm not going to swear this is true, this looks like a pre-1975 um, uh, non-mandatory mine remnant. Uh, the, the state is dotted with them. Before, uh, in 1975, 
uh, legislature passed a bill requiring phosphate miners to reclaim, not restore, just reclaim to some economic use um, to the land destroyed by phosphate mining. And so they must do something. At least they go through the motions, and, and Mosaic goes through the motions, and uh, you know does the absolute bare minimum that they can, and 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 crows about it to anybody who will listen with millions of dollars of advertising. Um, this filling in with sand uh, has apparently just stopped, and the, uh, the area has been abandoned, and this will be there for ever. Right, what's happening is my cursor slips off. There's another mine scene again. These are these are um, settling areas that have uh, gradually filled in and silted in to the point where they're solid, rock solid, like Bob said, just a plug of, of clay. Uh, little bits of forest that they may, they're often required to set aside and preserve about 15, 16 percent of the land in a mine. Uh, where it may have been a wetland, it may have been something else. And, uh, and this is what we get. Here's another, uh, on, on this drag line, you can see the little cars and trucks. Gives you a sense of scale. And they just dig and dig, so. And that's your new aquifer, too. Not only are they digging up the uh, 60 feet, they're digging up all of one aquifer and part of another one. Yeah. And that's the reclaimed aquifer right there. So you can drink that. It's pretty astonishing. There's one of these things up close and personal. There's an art to it. The guys who run these things are skilled. They're crafted. They're like craftsmen. You know, they, they, they leave these curved lines. You know what they're doing. They, you know, dig the grooves and everything like that, and then they move on. These things are too big to run with a diesel engine, and they're too, the, the, the controls are too precise to be run with a diesel with a clutch and gears and stuff like that, so they're electric. And I have heard, and I'm not sure this could possibly be true, but that mosaics operations, the, the, the drag lines use more electricity than, uh, than all the municipal operations in Tampa. There's me in front of a drag line bucket. This is an old drag line bucket. I think the new ones are considerably larger. Gives you a sense of scale again. You know, this stuff is not a good neighbor. Okay, this guy, the mosaic was supposed to build a big burn between their mine and this fellow's house. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't put up a timber line. They didn't put up trees. They didn't put anything. They just mined it and got out. And it was like, you know, you know like it's Sumi. This is how so much gets done anymore in Florida. Um, the, the, uh, the mining runs 24-7 when it's running, 24-7. Um, and it was... Um, uh, the, the lights come on, and the bright lights shine all night, and the chains clank, and the thing creaks and groans, and the drag line crunches. The guy didn't get a night's sleep for years. Here's another shot of uh, another map that uh, Don Rice has doctored up for our benefit. This one shows also gives some stacks outlined in red. Those two are in the river view. Uh, there's one there. There's 23 over 24 of them statewide. Uh, combined, they cover over 11 square miles of ground, uh, and they comprise the largest toxic waste repository in the United States. I'll get to that in a minute. This is another shot of this is what you start with when you're about to start a mine. This is Bob's wife. Bob Nabins is sitting over there. I'll shoot him with a laser, but then he'd be blind, and then he'd be really angry at me. Um, it's an ancient oak tree. We just love these ancient oak trees. And you know, this is this is a mine and it is it's gone now, right? This yeah. This is going to be part of the Ono mine. This is a classic pine flatwood. I don't know why the photograph is so dark, but it is. This is an absolute perfect pine pine flatwood uh, habitat, and it is slated to become uh, a mine called the Ono mine. We're going to fight it tooth and nail. Uh, it is not a done deal yet. They don't have their Corps of Engineers permits. They typically get, first and foremost, with just for waking up in the morning, they get their FDEP permits. Because the FDEP has to give them a permit within 60 days. Um, and, and Craig Pittman's book about wetlands, um, Paving Paradise, 
It's a must read. You all have to read it. It's a saga of the total failure of a regulatory agency, the Corps of Engineers, and the FDEP also. And the way he puts it, um, they have to, if they don't issue a permit, yay or nay, within 60 days, it automatically becomes a yes. So they rush to issue a yes, to authorize, to give the permits. And they, you know, come right racing through it. On the mine's going to be 22,000 acres. 22,000 acres. Uh, here's another shot. This is, you know, I was, I was here. This is a, um, a vernal wetland off in here. An intermittent wetland. It's just a stunningly beautiful place. A little cattle ranch part of it. And these are the species, some of the species we have to, you know, that are going to be displaced by this. The famous crested caracara. The famous gopher tortoise. And what Mosaic still does not quite understand is that the, the tortoise is one thing. The burrow, the burrow is the, is the key element. There's something like that. How many species? Like I've heard 200 species, 300, 300 species, <laughs> depend on that burrow at different times, including the endangered indigo snake. So, you know, just taking the tortoise out and saying, well, come rescue you, honey, before the bulldozers come through, doesn't rescue anything. Uh, it's, a, it's a farce, it's a fallacy. And then, of course, the panther. Everybody you talk to, every regulator, in the state is in total denial that these animals are up in that area and reproducing and having family. I mean, there's a, a panther, a, a mating pair of panthers on the Bobby Jones golf course uh, in Sarasota on Fruitville Road. Uh, the kittens have been seen, they've been photographed. Oh, no, 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 they're really not there. That's the kind of thing we get. And, and you know, here's photographic evidence for Wachula. Just, just, it's none of it, nothing's enough to stop the juggernaut of the perceived economic benefit from fossil fuel, and we'll get to that in a minute. Here's one of those, as far as the eye can see, mine, 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 clay settling areas, mine, 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 but just off into the distance. And this is uh, the beginning of the reclamation section, <laughs> such as it is. It's a very brief section. This is the sort of stuff that Mosaic talks about. Mosaic, you know, nobody is there's no, there's no audience like this. This is like literally the first public presentation I've been able to give in the, along the coastline. People don't know what phosphate mining is, what it does, and above all, they have no idea what mosaic is. Mosaic doesn't tell anybody what they do. They just talk about how good they are. And so I've asked people, do you know what mosaic is? And they say, well, I think mosaic's an environmental group. So they, you know, they they promise to reclaim the land, and they they make it look like they're restoring it. They're not. They don't restore. If there's not enough money in Mosaic's entire, you know, capital formation to do restoration on all their mined lands, they they reclaim so bare minimum to get a few things to grow out of the ground. Uh, they've been able to grow, I think, eucalyptus trees. Uh, they've been able to graze, to grow enough grass to, to let some cows wander onto these places, but but the grass is radioactive, so the farmers pull the cows off and just you know. So basically, nobody wants to buy it, uh, nobody wants to build on it, nobody wants it, and it's worthless for animals. And this is how it's going to be for centuries. This is this is a a water course now. Between the Oda Mine, Whitgate East, and, and, and the others, they're going to 